school or college, bring your backpack. Oh, now we're working. Uh, and uh, it will be blessed. The, the first place I was at where they did this, uh, the graduate students all brought their backpacks, uh, <laughs> as well as the children. Let's see. Yeah. In two weeks, we'll have our annual church picnic at Lord's Park. Bring food. If you've got a musical instrument, bring that too, and we'll make a joyful noise. You don't need to practice beforehand. So, Pam, you're waving something. So, well, Is, other announcements? Yes. And Jesus has left the building is, is about what? What are we doing in these projects? We are going to go to the different project sites. Some are here at church. Some are out in the community. Some are for members of our church. What kind of projects? <clears throat> um, they're physical projects, and we have um, some visiting projects, too. So we're going to visit shut-ins again. Um, and we're also going to do some cleaning, some yard work, um, some organizing, like of garages. Um, we're gonna we're gonna work at some organizations and do yard work for them. So basically, whatever's needed. But we're trying to go out into the community and spruce it up and live some love that way. And it's September twenty third too. Okay, so we got another month, but start start thinking. Yes. Uh, let's greet one another with the peace of Christ. Let us remember that guided by the Holy Spirit, the purpose of First Congregational United Church of Christ is to seek, seek God's, God's truth, truth, practice Christ's Christ teachings, teachings, and love, love others, others unconditionally.
Our lives are like narratives. We have beginnings, complications, and endings. We pray that our life stories will be good stories with meaning and joy. Our lives are like poetry, discoveries of grace and wisdom, surprising clearings in the forest of life. We pray that the poetry of our lives will give grace to others, help them discover love and joy. In worship, we open ourselves to God that we might receive inspiration, love, and grace, and so learn to write our lives well. Praise God. I invite you to join me as we center ourselves in the presence of the Holy. Eternal God, whose word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, we recognize and confess that we have failed to respond fully to your gracious presence in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, you have offered us new life, fulfillment, and the freedom to serve you. We confess that we are captive to sin, that our sin binds us with false pride, and that the wrong we do is made worse by the good we leave undone. Reconcile us to you and all people. God of mercy, forgive all our sin and strengthen us anew for life as you intended. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Jesus lived in love with all whom he met, letting nothing separate him from authentic relationship with others. Jesus accepted death at the hands of those whom he loved and was resurrected from the dead in witness to God's redeeming and all-powerful love. In Jesus, we know that God loves us, that we are forgiven. Let us celebrate God's love. Please be seated. And let's see. Children's sermon now? Is it the children's sermon now or the matter? Yes, it is the children. If the children would come forward. (sighs) 
you can't, actually, this is better for you guys' age than for the really younger ones. So thank you for coming up. Mm. Your turn. <laughs> so thank you for coming up. This church talks a lot about live love. What does that mean? To help other people and just to, and also to show people that somebody out there does care about them. Help other people, show others that someone does care. You know what that means, live love? Who do you know who lives love? Carrots? Mm-hmm. That's a good answer. Who else is a good example of, a live, of living love? Yeah? Jesus. Jesus? Mm-hmm. When in doubt in church, the answer is always Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Or it's never Ron, anyway. But the, yes, obviously, that's a, that's a great. Any examples in your life? Uh, mm -hmm. That's a good answer, too. Parents. Parents? Mm hmm. Do your parents love you? Yeah. And do you love your parents? Mm hmm. Do you love your sister? Mm -hmm. So you get to live love for her, which is pretty cool. And she loves everybody. Any other ideas? Helping other people know that they're loved and Jesus and carrots. Let us pray. Help us, God to live love, uh, to receive love from our parents and friends, and to give love for people who need it. Uh, in, help us to be like Jesus. Amen. Thank you for coming up. I need to have the bunny back. Then he'll be here next week for you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is from Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, and it is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. The second reading is from Mark 11, verse 25. Whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses.
Will you join with me in prayer? Oh God, be with us in this hour, that we may feel your presence, that we may learn of your ways, that we may grow in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Millard Fuller was a member of the First Congregational Church of, it was either Montgomery or Birmingham, Alabama. And he was a lawyer, and he was a good one. And he invested well, so that by the time he was in his uh, middle to late 30s, he uh, was wealthy. Uh, but he was also unhappy. And his wife and he were on a trip to New York City from Alabama, and on their way back, they decided they would stop off at Koinonia Farms in Georgia where Clarence Jordan had organized the covenantal community and they were trying to live out the Sermon on the Mount. And when he was there, he was impressed and he liked it. And he offered to give Jordan a lot of money to support the ministry. Now, Jordan, the farm, the farm needed the money. On the other hand, Jordan looked at him and realized there was temptation here, staring him in the face. And he said, um, what am I going to do with it? Give it to someone else. That impressed Fuller a lot, and so he went home. He gave his money to the United Church Board for World Ministries, which did take it, and commissioned him as a missionary for our church, and he went to Congo, and he worked on housing. And then he came back to this country and he founded Habitat for Humanity on the model of no more shacks. And they've built houses for millions of people around the world. One summer down in Alabama, there was a traveling revivalist who came through the town that they were living in. And his daughter expressed curiosity in going. And Fuller was kind of curious, too, because if you're a Congregationalist, you sort of stay away from that sort of thing. Uh, but he was now secure enough in his faith that he would go and see what they were doing. And so they went, and the evangelist 
spoke on sin. He was against it. You're surprised. <laughs> His illustrations of sin, however, were premarital sex and marijuana. And as Fuller looked around the people in the room, he realized that the days of premarital sex had been a long time ago. <laughs> he and his daughter were the two youngest people there. And this was not the marijuana crowd either. So the evangelist had picked illustrations of sin that his audience was safe from. And Fuller had two questions. First, why did he do that? And secondly, the problem that when your conception of sin is so small that it doesn't include you, then God's grace doesn't include you either. And the people, no one was going to be converted at this rally. They would just feel better about themselves, about things that they were probably already pleased with. Now, an anthropologist would raise their hand and say, aha, aha, I know the answer to the first question. He, you see, if you're a revivalist, you get your money from the offerings that people give. And one of the notes that revivalists learn is you don't make your audience too angry because they don't give so much. So you want to keep it on the safe side. And he wasn't trying to convert people anyway. He was trying to get them to think of building up the in-group mentality. He wanted them to cohere as a group and to feel strongly about themselves and see uh, themselves as against the world. It's a particular kind of ritual uh, which builds up the in-group identity as opposed to the people out there. It's a useful thing to do for groups, but it has the problem that Jesus didn't like it much because the people who were outside the in-group were sinners. They were people uh, who had diseases. They were people who everyone in those days thought were cursed or had demons or was something wrong with them. And so they were the outsiders. And Jesus spent his life reaching out to the outsiders and bringing them in. He was about breaking down those barriers. He was a lover, not a fighter, a healer, not someone who hurt others. And he was an includer, not an excluder. And when religion turns to fighting, turns to hurting, turns to excluding the other, then something contrary to Jesus is going on. To use Paul, now we're talking about sin. And in this day and age, we're also talking about politics. Because the winning strategy in American politics for the last 30 years or so has been to rally the troops at home and to build up your in-group identity and make sure your people get out to vote. You're not really expanding the pie, you're just making sure that your slice gets served. And that's oftentimes enough to win the election because the Republicans and the Democrats are pretty much evenly split and it's whoever gets their home troops out who wins the election. Now, I know that demo, de, oh dear, demagoguery, there we go, demagoguery is not new in American politics. Back in the 19th century, th th they were awful to one another. Uh, Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton for reasons. Uh, because he had been slandered and libeled and they didn't like one another much anyway. People have tended to go dirty on politics when there aren't enough differences to really justify making a division. Or they go dirty when the issues are so important that 
you have to do anything in order to win. And the ends justify the means. Or you go dirty uh, when you can't really talk about the real issues because there's nothing that anyone can do about them anyway. You know, in 1850, you could talk about slavery all you wanted, and we weren't going to solve that issue then. And so you found other ways to find your differences. So politicians can always find a way to go dirty. And someone commented to me that, uh, last week that uh, in a campaign, you always have to get ready for the unexpected attack that's going to come sailing in out of left field, which happens, oh, around two months before the election. So, you know, just don't get surprised. It happens every year. But we're at a point in American civic life when civic behavior seems especially degraded. Normally, around 22 congressional representatives or senators will choose to retire at the end of their term. They're, they're too old, they're running for a different office, they figure they're going to lose, so they might as well uh, retire with dignity. This year, 66 have announced that they're not running. Record numbers. Outright lies have become a daily tactic instead of something to be embarrassed about. And faced with conflicts over what is happening in America and the world, instead of seeking better news, deeper understandings, Americans' search for news descends to late-night television jokes and tweets and ideological organs that are designed to advance a particular point of view at the expense of others. Instead of searching for common ground, political excitement seems to be flowing to the extremes with less and less ability to work together to solve problems. And we have a tendency to see one another in dualistic terms, you're either with the forces of cosmic good, like me, or you're with the forces of cosmic evil, like you. <laughs> and you can do anything you want to evil people. There's nothing like a noble end to justify evil in our hands. From the denunciation of President Obama for not being an American because he just couldn't be, to the denunciations of Trump supporters as being simply deplorables, points to the creation of an open wound in America. We have met the enemy, proclaimed Walt Kelly's cartoon figure, Pogo, and he is us. So the question that holds this together is, well, where is their forgiveness? Where is their grace? in such a time as this. And to address that, we have to first think about what does forgiveness mean? It does not mean that what we do has no consequences. When we live in alienation from God and ourselves and others, when we do things that hurt others in the earth, saying sorry isn't a get out of jail free card. It allows us to avoid all reality. If you drink and drive, you can tell the police officer that, I'm sorry, but you're still going to lose your license. <laughs> Pollution based on carbon-based fuels will surely have consequences, whether it's in our lifetime or our children's. Forgiveness does not mean that we are free to keep sinning against others. The traditional thinking about getting forgiveness is that you simply ask for it. And that's been severely critiqued back in the Protestant condemnation of indulgences and the Reformation to modern era feminists who have said, look, you get someone who's abusing their spouse and they say, I'm sorry, and then the good Christian woman is expected to say, that's okay, I forgive you. And then he goes on and keeps abusing her because it's about power, it's about rage. It's about things we don't understand. And the church becomes complicit in the abuse that continues on. Things have to change. Grace has to include that. It is not true, as a compromand once argued to me, that of course God forgives him, forgives me. That's his job. 
Jesus did not die on the cross to gain a resume line. When we receive God's forgiveness, it changes us. The forgiveness that Paul talks about from Jesus' death changes those who receive it, knowing that the past is done and over with, and what counts is what comes next, how we live from now on. There was forgiveness of sins so that Greeks and Hebrews could live together in a new faith and in the love of Christ. It was that new path, that new love that mattered. We stop giving false beliefs and actions, addictions and relationships, power over our lives. When I was a student at the World Board, we got a letter once from a woman who claimed that she was demonically possessed and could we help her. Uh, all the mail went to the, the top boss's desk and he decided that something like this was clearly something that the Treasury Division needed to deal with. So he came to my boss and said, here, Miles, you deal with this. And my boss looked at it and said, there's real pain in this person's life. Um, what do you know about it? And frankly, I didn't know much about demonic possession. I was just not a course I had taken in seminary, though it turned out I had a professor who had written the book on it. So I called him up and asked him what to do, and he gave me links. And I talked to the person who dealt with this in the New York area and learned that people who think they're demonically possessed get treated the same way that people who have various mental illnesses, which is the same way that people who have addictions get treated. You have to stop letting it have power over you. And whatever you do to stop giving the demonic in its various forms power is what you're free to do. That's forgiveness. It's living a new way. When we forgive, we change. A University of Wisconsin psychologist Robert Enright has studied for 30 years people who were deeply wounded. They were abused children. They were the victims of war crimes. They were people who had suffered the worst things that you can imagine. And he studied what kept them alive in the years to come and learned that those who were able to forgive were happier and healthier than those who could not. There's something about being able to, being able to forgive someone that releases the power that the wound has over you. That when I say, I forgive you, I'm not letting the injury that you've given still have power in my life. But forgiveness is not the same as silence. It is different from getting away with it. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was formed after their civil war uh, in which atrocities were committed by both sides, and it was oftentimes impossible to tell who had done the atrocity because the apartheid government would do atrocities and try to make it look like the ANC had done it, and the ANC would do atrocities and try to make it look like the government had done it. And so they self dealt with this by simply announcing that if you came to the commission and confessed your crimes, you would not be prosecuted. But you had to speak the truth. You had to tell it what it was that you did. And of course, some people refused to talk, but others came forward and admitted that they were not proud of what they had done, but they had done it because of the fighting and the war and the hatred that had taken over their lives. And they asked for forgiveness, and it was given to them. Telling the abuser that they have hurt you when you can do that safely recovers a sense of power and control for yourself. There's an adage in the abuse, healing, trauma-aware industry, forgive, but not too soon, because you've got to do your own work at getting healed before you can forgive another, before forgiveness can simply be moving your lips. For this church to be a source of forgiveness and grace in this time is going to take some work. 
We will need to be open to the witnesses of others who have suffered injuries in our land and in some cases at our hands. We will need the courage to give voice and support to those who have been wounded because some of them cannot speak for themselves and need allies. We will need faith in God to recognize that we are all under the love and judgment of God and that our salvation depends not on being right on the issues, but on the grace of God who loves us. And we need humility to recognize how we have been a part of the problem in either what we have said or what we have been silent to when we witnessed what was going wrong. Humility because the things that we fight over so passionately right now may not prove to be right or even important when we look at them at a later date. When we live our faith, when we live the love that Jesus calls us to be about, then we can be a sign of God's love and healing in a hurting world. And the world needs that sign. They need us to be this beacon of light. Amen.
Gracious God, we thank you. We thank, we thank you, you for, for the blessings, blessings of love and friendship, friendship for, for meaningful, meaningful lives and relationships, relationships, for the, for the opportunities, opportunities we have in our lives. Out of gratitude to you, we extend these offerings of service and money that we might extend the blessings of your ways to others. Amen. Amen. Jesus died to show God's love all the sins I can needs love and grace and forgiveness. Let us go forth from this place and be bearers of that word, bearers of that love. Amen.